Hello, everyone. All right, this is going to be a very interesting discussion. Super excited to be here with the three of you. I'm humbled and inspired by your work. Um, I believe the three gentlemen here don't need much of an introduction. They have accomplished great things. On my left here, we have Benjamin. I think he's the most famous face in the room. <laughs> <laughs> we have Mr. Philip Rosedale here from Second Life. Unbelievable work. And I think Herman Arula doesn't need any introduction anymore today. He had a great panel before. <laughs> and I, uh, I just wanted to give uh, apologies on behalf of Nicole, who is in Paris, but unfortunately incredibly ill, so could not make it to the panel. I've been waiting to see if she could come, but I'm going to represent her here as well. Next time. Next time. She came all the way here just to get sick, which is I feel really bad about that. <laughs> well, hopefully she will feel better soon. Hope so. Great. Yeah. All right, guys. So let's get started. Um, the first question is a pretty interesting one. Uh, the four of us are parents, fathers. Uh, so one question that I'm also very curious about is how do you guys believe that the metaverse is going to both impact education as a whole as well as our children? I mean, I guess if I jump in, um, I would say that the purpose of experiences we have in the metaverse or in virtual worlds is fulfillment. And that's not a casual idea. That's a formal scientific idea from self-determination theory. Everybody in this room needs fulfilling experiences. You need to feel like you're getting better at something. You need to feel like you're making meaningful choices in your life autonomy. You need to matter to other people. And if you don't have those experiences, then your life suffers, your psychology suffers in pretty profound, pretty terrible ways. And we see this in the world when we see people disenfranchised with society, angry with their role in it, and it, all kinds of geopolitical and human problems come from that. And conversely, the more fulfillment you get, the richer your life becomes. Like if you guys have ever heard of uh, the lion, the witch, and the wardrobe, you know, the kids that went to Narnia. It's a pretty good metaphor. Those kids went to Narnia, they came back, and they came back smarter and wiser and better. So if a diet of healthy experiences is the basis of growth for a human being, then providing kids with more examples of healthy, fulfilling experiences is key. And I would say that that the normal diet kids get is a bit like McDonald's, you know? They, they're just passively watching things or playing basic games. The metaverse can go so much further. It can give them an opportunity to earn their first income, make meaningful lifelong friends, learn new skills, have agency, which often kids, especially in other parts of the world, don't get. So it's, it's vital for, for how children's lives can improve. You know, um it, 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 there's 20 years of Second Life now to kind of study as we look at what happens next. And in fact, um, uh, education in, in, a, in a number of different forms, you know, continuing education, uh, you know, education with younger people, uh, a lot of university education is, is one of the big things that, that goes on every day in Second Life. Um, so I, I definitely, you know, get it from that perspective. I, I think that as we look toward the future, I also think that education is one of the categories where the technology, the problems we have with the technology today will kind of come together to, to build a working solution first. I think that's because when, when you're learning, you're willing to uh, deal with frustrations and, you know, struggle with the interface, if you will, a little bit more than if you are, say, hanging out in a club or something like that. So I think there's going to be, uh, I, I agree, I, I, or I agree with the question, I think there's going to be a big impact from education. Of course, there's all kinds of risks in general with kids and, and the metaverse, and I talk about that all the time, but I do think that education is one that we're likely to see um, create meaningful change in the next couple of years as people start to do it. What, what I would add is that it seems to me that at its very best, life sort of becomes a game of education if throughout the experience you can have a bit of self-awareness, a bit of introspection, a bit of detachment. And it seems like education as opposed to what we've looked at, um, let's say, in the past, 
will very, very much have to do with the kind of synthesis that um, the closer you are to seeing the world as it is and being able to able and open to interface with the world, as you have these experiences, it, the, the funny and interesting and fascinating thing is that we all have experiences and then those experiences can become valuable, very meaningful lessons if we can detach a bit from them and look at them in a new light. So I do believe that the metaverse is a unique tool that can facilitate this type of, let's say, reflection, experience, and then interaction that is definitely um, more meaningful, more fulfilling, um, and then opens more bridges for interaction with other social um, social set setups and, and so forth. But it seems like to the degree that we can make education this type of continuous synthesis that you have to deal with as you interact with new ideas or just new elements of reality, to that extent, it becomes something absolutely exciting, fascinating, and so forth, that you want to deal it, uh, with each day. And it also seems like this is what the current system can fundamentally not do, because it's too much rooted on, on systems that have been built 100 years ago and, and all of that. So ideally, with these tools, we are in a position to open new worlds of meaning, experience, um, and um, we, we can definitely do that with uh, fresh eyes now. I would say meaning, experience, and opportunity, and that's maybe what my next question is about. The metaverse is a, is a destination, right? It's a, it's, a, it's a place. Do you guys believe there is something specific that maybe we can learn and adopt better in the metaverse than in the real world? I mean, I'd say that, and I talk a bit about this in my book, but I think to think of the metaverse as just about virtual worlds really breaks one's perception of the wider opportunity. If you think of the metaverse instead as a continuation of a massive and fundamental pillar of our existing culture, you know, we already live in other worlds. We already live in other realities. Our existence is already about sport, fashion, culture. These are all made up things. The stock market, kind of a made up thing in some ways. So understanding how all of these worlds can become better connected, better transfer value, better create and facilitate new opportunities, that's kind of the place that is the metaverse, you know, to relate this back to your question. It's, it's, it's the confluence of all of these other worlds. And most of the failed efforts to build metaverses have failed because they failed to recognize that that value transfer is like so vitally important. That's what brings it value. That's what makes it not a video game. I, th I think as humans, it, it, there's a danger that if we construct, if we, if we imagine initially and then we build a metaverse, metaverses, whatever, as a destination where we consume things, right? There's a terrible dystopian danger in that. Um, it, w we are at our best when we are forced, forced in conflict with each other sometimes to co-create the world around us. That's what our great cities are, like Paris. You know, it's a place where a whole bunch of people had, in many cases, very different intentions, and you ended up with Paris. So we have to enable the, the metaverse to have the same fundamental structure, that people are coming there to bring something of themselves to the place and to build things. And, you know, this is literally something that's distinctive about Second Life, but it's just a general, uh, very important thing, that we have to enable each other to, to build, and, and actually to build together, not to, not to build alone, to, to, to build, you know, as I said, in conflict with each other. That's what's going to, that, that's the opportunity to let us be at our best. And, and with the metaverse stuff, there are also opportunities to absolutely make us at our worst. And I would um, also add that per perhaps distinctly, um, we are in a position to completely rethink what have been some of the most important breakthroughs 
um, throughout history when it comes to, let's say, something like what the city really meant. Um, and, and there's a very vivid metaphor that usually evokes something that cannot easily fade away when you say the state, the idea of the eternal city. That in a new, let's say, fortress that would be open-ended, that you could start and build things from scratch, you could both have the most fundamentally remarkable ideas built, whether it's architecture, whether it's beautiful aesthetics, whether it's um, new experiments in social interaction or um, economic opportunities that you can open up, what enabled Rome at some point to literally dominate the world was how from nothing some people with a determination that still makes great legends went and built something that after 2,000 years we can still look back and say there are many distinct things that we've throughout the time discovered but it's absolutely fascinating what these guys at that period have discovered, ex have experimented with and I do believe that unlike some of the physical spaces that we have that precisely because they are maybe very crowded, very um, regulated, very closed at this point, um, we have ways to demonstrate and envision new type of, for instance, cities that then can bring feedback loops to the real world back. And it is in this type of um, interaction that we can not only build and be part of the building process, but then also think about this type of um, fundamentally impressive spaces for distinct um, purposes, whether it's governance, as I said, whether it's social experience, whether it's learning experience, whether it's fulfillment, entertainment, and, and so forth. For each of them, you could easily think of something that goes a bit beyond the frontier, has not been tried, has always looked absolutely fascinating. And then uh, taking education, for instance, um, if you imagine being able to travel to Rome or to Athens or wherever else, and then having a conversation not only with Einstein, but then with Aristotle, and some of the other guys, there's absolutely no better way to interface and learn than having this type of conversations with any character that, um, that would bring the best in you, would convey the information and probably reveal something that you've not seen up until that point. Very interesting answers here. W w one word that comes into my mind when listening to you guys is also inspiration. I do hope the, the metaverse will inspire a new generation of builders. You've all built companies, the three of you. I'm sure you've had people or destinations or experiences that have inspired you and impacted the way you've built your companies. I was wondering, was there something specific throughout your founder journeys that you thought you know, could have been helpful to you in your journeys if the metaverse already existed? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think one of the most poisonous, destructive, nasty aspects of founding a company, particularly in the last 20 years, is this winner-takes-all mentality. You know, this, uh, we all admire like Steve Jobs and Apple, but it created a kind of culture of mega corporations for whom everything must be owned. You know, it's the Google-branded login with the Google-branded world with the Google-branded application. I think one of the most inspirational things for me personally is encountering other companies, other partners, and stopping seeing everybody as a competitor or a zero-sum uh, you know, enemy and starting to appreciate the power of collaboration. I think when I learned more about the stories of you know, businesses outside of tech, you see how interdependent people become. And I think meeting great founders like Phil, meeting people like Benjamin, it's very, very eye-opening. And you know, even Nicole, who, who, who couldn't be here, but you know, these are relationships that kind of transcend customers or partners. They start to become you know, 
core visionaries in creating something bigger together. I also think this lesson has a lot to say for us in the Web3 space because our, our, our sort of opponents, if there are any, are not, you know, it, it's not the tech world at large, but it's the people that are seeking to own everything. You know, that, that mindset is, is, so is so destructive. You know, moving past it takes quite a lot. But I don't know, Phil, you must have a lot of experience on this. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I've gotten to, it, it's been a while, so I've, I've, I've gotten to uh, go through an experience several times with, with different groups of people. I would agree about what you said, Herman, that, that one thing is you, when you start a company, you've got to realize whether your company is in a sort of an entirely new space that is accretive for everybody that's in that space, which is, as, as Herman said, is very often actually the case. I mean, a lot of startups do actually go that way, and yet their investors and their boards will often counsel them to kind of, exactly. you, know, rec you know, imagine that there's but one small pie and there can be only one winner and, you know, you've got to be the one and not sleep and whatnot. Uh, I think that it, it's true. If, if, you, if you step at what I would have liked to have realized, you know, at the time, you know, when Second Life, say, was taking off, would, would be to have somebody reiterate to me that it was that, that first unusual kind of thing where, we were just building an entirely new ecosystem and world, and there was plenty of room for everybody. I, I got it, but not in all my moments and all my board meetings did I get it. I'd be afraid sometimes and think like I've got to, you know, I've got to win at all costs. <laughs> so it was. Benjamin, can you expand as well? Yeah. So I I would say that it's um, again very interesting how throughout history, reality has been very very different. Um, and through most of history, the world was uh, very much a zero-sum game to some extent. Um, and it's through ingenuity, learning, continuous discoveries that we've always discovered somehow that um, the resources were not as fixed as we thought them, but rather more, more, more like a function of our mental limitations rather than what resources really meant and what resources really were in the world. And then also the idea of conquering the metaphors and all of that were a function of the games you could play and were available throughout history. And then technology as we have it today has distinctly opened up non-zero-sum games that we can play that instead of us fighting together, and trying to take the other spy, we can essentially gather large groups of people, offer them platforms, and then some of them create even larger products, visions, and, and so forth. And in fact, everything we're discussing today, we would probably not discuss without the internet, without writing different versions of language and, and so forth. So it's absolutely fascinating how technology at its best opens this up, this, this type of non-zero-sum or positive-sum games where people can really ally, ally get, get other allies to open up even larger opportunities. This is always um, remarkable and um, it, instructive. It, it's why, you know, when people talk about why should, the blo why should the metaverse exist now? Why not five years ago? Why not 10 years ago? It's not graphics, it's not, you know, it, it can be technology and capability, but it's the ability to share value so that companies can co-create, can collaborate. That's why I think Web3 and blockchain are just so much more important to that future than, than VR headsets. And this is just translating this, this is just reinventing the free market exactly. in a digital way. Exactly. So we've, we've had sort of digital communism uh, of, of some sort or feudalism, now, having this new type of expression all of a sudden uh, gives birth to a lot of ideas, a lot of explorations that can uh, take shape. And um, in this, I, I suspect and uh, very strongly believe that the blockchain will contribute tremendously. And, and maybe not in its entirely current form. There's a lot to improve. I don't know, Phil, you're a skeptic on some of this stuff, but we need tools to share value because culture is created by the powerless, not the powerful. And a living, breathing, exciting space, not like the soulless, legless, dead avatars in another product that we might not talk about here, 
you know, <laughs> it, it requires risk. You know, I, I mean, Phil, I think that's something you've taught me quite a lot as well. I mean, second life is a place of risk, right? It's a place where you don't know what's going to happen. It's also the case, it's interesting to, to note that the metaverse and the blockchain is in the same place that, say, Second Life was around 2006, which is everybody in the world is talking about it. Nobody has any idea what it's actually going to be used <laughs> for now, yet. And that was, tr that was absolutely true of Second Life. You had the same thing. You had everybody in the whole world saying, oh, my God, am I going to have to move to the virtual world? And, and, and everybody wanted to talk about it and write about it. But we still hadn't, and in some sense we still haven't found what widely used experience or, you know, pattern of behavior we're all actually all going to get into. And the same is true here, which is another argument for work together. It's an exciting moment, but we still have to find what the thing is we're going to do every day with this stuff. And if I were to even boil everything down to one thing that the blockchain um, sort of undoubtedly brings as a huge contribution is this idea of full ownership, yeah, absolutely. that if you have even only this thing, you're already in the process of enabling a new type of world. Just as this idea being present in a country enabled thousands, hundreds of thousands, and then millions of people to reorganize and, and build and something completely different. And to extend your your metaphor of a country, you know, you look at democracies and dictatorships and communist countries, and you ask which country would you rather invest in? Well, you're gonna wanna invest in the country where you have ownership, where you can make choices, where maybe you can protect your money. That's but the real battle here. And make it even more fundamental. In which country would you live? Exactly. Would you bring your exactly. family? I, I, would exactly. you bring you know, your children and, and so forth? An interesting philosophical side note to that of ownership, though, is to notice that the universe does not have any concept of ownership. If you look at atoms, if you look at the atoms in my hand, and you get the microscope and you close in on it, it doesn't have any metadata on it. No. Does it? <laughs> Are we sure about that? We're pretty sure, right? That's the hidden, hidden Let's data. Let's zoom in a bit more. But <laughs> My background's physics. That's a good, you're right, that's a good, even a more fun conversation. It definitely, but it definitely doesn't run on Solana. <laughs> but crash every two hours. Never mind. Woo, woo, woo! I knew that would be a cheap laugh, so anyway, continue. Well, but, but what's interesting is, is that, the, the, so, so in that sense, so first of all, the universe doesn't give us ownership. Ownership is a social contract. It's an agreement that we make. So, for example, you don't own art that was posted on the blockchain. The blockchain in that case is, or the early versions of it, is kind of suggesting an idea, which is the first person who uploads something owns it, right? That idea is probably not the right one in the long term, but what we see with the blockchain is essentially a suggestion for a different social contract, and that's really what we're all negotiating. And again, it's going to be contingent on finding use cases for it that, that reiterate that, that make, that make sense to us, right? And perhaps NFTs are an example of that thus far. I'm, I'm curious, what's a social contract? Like, I, I totally agree that most of the tools are essentially suggestions that we choose to believe in and then we extend and expand. What, what is democracy? What is this very idea of ownership? What, what do we actually own? You know what I think of that? It, with, it would be like common law marriage. If you live with someone for a long time, we all kind of agree mutually, in most places across the world, that you, have a, you, you owe each other something, right? So you, you have this concept there that is larger than the legal system. It's a, it's a social contract. We sort of think it makes sense that way. Mm -hmm. And I think what's interesting about the blockchain is it's re-examining what the social contracts around ownership need to be. Uh, mm -hmm. It's suggesting to all of us how things could work. Sure. It, it's also ex extending the idea of creativity into ingenuity. So, you know, when you're in a platform like Roblox or whatever the, you know, proto metaverses are or whatever creativity you can do online, you can make up what you want to make up. I think what the blockchain and metaverses enabled by the blockchain allow for is for it to be more like a continuing story. You can create something new that corresponds to the rules of the story that have existed before you. Like, when you tell a legend about Zeus, you know, or Hercules, you can't have Hercules suddenly be weak. That doesn't fit with the rules of that narrative. So it's a way for us to co-create stories together, and those stories become the basis of culture, and that culture becomes the basis of an economy, and that allows us to create more value. And I feel like, in some ways, the, the, the coolest thing about this whole space is 
not just what it is, but what it isn't. It isn't just video games. You know, it, it isn't just play to earn stuff on the blockchain. It's a whole new category. And I think defining that is going to be quite challenging. It's amazing. I love this panel. It's moderating itself. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> I think I speak on behalf of everyone that uh, you guys are very inspiring. So I had a personal question for all of you now, uh, a different one for each. And I wanted to start with Philip. Um, when you created Second Life, um, this was a while back, right? Web 2 was still fresh, new. What were your challenges and uh, how did you overcome them? What was the one lesson you want to share with us that you're particularly you know, thoughtful on? Well, I think that uh, there were a lot of technical challenges because I started the company in 1999. Uh, computers were a lot slower then. <laughs> um, That's a good one. Second Life was designed, I started the company for two reasons. One was that the very first graphics chip had come out, which is called the GeForce 2, that was in everybody's computers, or at least desktop computers. The second one was, Broadband was a thing. Now, broadband, when I designed Second Life, was 200 kilobits per second. And I was like, More than enough. that'll be plenty. <laughs> this is going to be amazing. Um, so there was a lot of technical work to be done. But I think the idea of people um, owning uh, and creating, and Herman and I were just talking off stage about live building and one's ability to one's ability to actually reach out and click on something in the, the metaverse and move it around or repaint it while your friend is sitting there laughing and watching you. That concept of enabling the individuals to build, rather, for example, enabling big companies to come in and do things they wanted to do. We had to make a choice between those two. And the choice we made was to support, was just to enable people to do things there. And a lot of people look back on Second Life and they think that we had big relationships with brands or something. Not at all. We heard about it afterwards. They'd come and complain to us about what didn't work. And, and you know, people, that's such an amazing point because Second Life had such a beautiful, eclectic set of cultures and subcultures and ideas. My co-founder actually paid his way through college, thanks to Philip, <laughs> uh, earning an income and learning to code inside Second Life. And you look at something like Fortnite now, and it's an amazing game. It's a stunning experience with a lot of value, and no one should throw shade at something that great. But all that IP is just licensed. It's just licensed together. It wasn't created the way that IP was created in Second Life. I think it's so stunning. I think you have to choose between the two is the point I was trying yeah. to make. In terms of like hard choices, we had to focus on letting people do what they wanted to in there. And we wouldn't have been able to do both that and like make bigger companies happy. So. Amazing. All right, my next question is for Herman. So um, with Improbable, you are also helping companies speed up, you know, reaching the point where the metaverse is a reality. You know, how are you removing the barriers, right? You're working with some of the most exciting projects in the world, the other side, X World. Tell us more, please. You know, when I first met uh, Benjamin, I uh, was naive about blockchain technology, trying to learn more about it. And I started talking about, oh, what do you think are Aptos and Mistin and all these new kind of companies? And him and his team just kind of smiled. And they were like, you don't even know the thousand problems that go into building a genuine production scale, proper working chain that can handle these things. And that's actually how we feel often about the metaverse space. You know, we see these companies and they do like a mini demo and we're like, wow, like you have no idea the nuclear reactor you have to build. So, so for me, the barriers, they start with one number, one single number. This number is my nightmare and it is also the single most important thing, operations per second. How much information can you exchange within the world? So the first and most important thing we do for companies is try to grow that number. Now, that number can't just be thousands, like a game of Fortnite, or even hundreds of thousands, like the most sophisticated, you would argue, um, uh, worlds within Second Life. 
It needs to be billions, tens of billions. And that means bandwidth compression, that not quite 200 kilobits for 9 to 350, but you know, 150 extra kilobits per second. Rendering technologies, other pieces. But the most important thing that we're trying to do for companies is make this as invisible as possible. Like, we want to make sure that if you're building in and creating metaverse experiences, you're not thinking about any of this. And that's a really tough job to do. And I think one of the biggest problems we haven't solved yet that I'm really hoping our collaboration with, with, with MultiverseX is going to do is, is how do you make the last mile easy? How do you make money coming in and out of the world? How do you make ownership easy? Because I know with Second Life, I mean, you guys had to become a bank to pull that off, basically, right. you know, back in the day. So I think there's a lot of open problems there. Very interesting. All right, my next question is for Benjamin, uh, who I think amongst the three of you is the, the youngest one to have ventured in, in this space. <laughs> and he's given us a, a very interesting uh, trailer and preview of <laughs> I'm younger, person. Are you sure? <laughs> All right. <laughs> Amazing. I, I'll take this as I'm a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think the the um, the audience here was was is very very curious about what you're doing with X World, right? So, how do you see you know the everyday person from the community, you know, engage with X World, use it on a daily basis? Is the next X Day happening in the metaverse? That's a good question. Mm. That's a good question. Um, but before answering that, um, I'll, I'll, I'll say two things that um, we've had many, many discussions about and that I believe uh, will be very interesting to answer. One, it's almost like you have to define when you're building this new type of worlds, what's really compelling, what's really exciting to a point that you would not sleep, not eat, and would only do that type of thing. Um, and if you can come up with a version of that and can extrapolate that and see what actually would be relevant to, to people, to, to a lot of humans, um, this goes back to what we were discussing before with um, education, with fulfillment, with meaning, with value. At the end of the day, what I was alluding to with the eternal city would be a kind of space where you could access the most fascinating and compelling versions of, as I said, education, work, experimentation, adventure, fulfillment, um, social interaction, and how these worlds would look is very much a question in itself. Perhaps some of the most interesting questions will be to take what we have in, in science at the frontier at this point and create worlds around those ideas and see how they would work, if they would bring that type of value and fulfillment to people, if they would open up new worlds and then all the people will, will at some point gradually want to experience this, this new type of worlds and I think we're much closer first to something that can really move us if we think about those things and then only after that try to break them into successive gradual milestones that we would have to hit in order to reach that point. Because it's, it's funny, we've been discussing this a lot and there's this story about um, I'm not sure who it was, but it was it were, there were two a authors that went and saw a cathedral. And they were so moved by the architecture that one of them essentially asked the other one, so what happened with the world? Why don't we build these types of buildings and so forth? And then the other guy said something that was, uh, again, very interesting that a lot of the world today is built on opinions, whereas something like that needs to be built with a lot more than an opinion. It needs a type of sacrifice and, and um, effort that is very different. So I'm both very, let's say, curious philosophically to explore and define a version of an eternal city 
on the one hand, and then also very pragmatic on the other hand in saying, of course, we have all these discussions. They are awesome and they are great, but some of them will take time for us to reach. So the question then becomes, what's perhaps one use cases that people from all over the world will be able to engage in? And I think a lot of the conversation with Herman has been on building and setting up the building blocks such that we can offer for any type of interaction in the world these rights, digital rights that you have that seem very common sense, but indeed give you a different optionality to what you would do in the world. The fact that you can create some objects and, for instance, sell them in, the mar in a marketplace and other people can use those objects to build houses or to build malls or to build fortresses or whatever they wish creates an ecosystem of value that already enables a different type of interaction. That's one thing. Um, and then the fact that we enable people to just join these worlds, that you don't need really need a headset and constrain the market to a few people that actually have access right now to a headset or have bought one and, and so forth, we believe is fundamentally important to enabling this type of technology. And then specifically with, with X-Worlds, um, we have some discussions regarding what would be, let's say, three distinct use cases. And I'll only take one. What would be a great use case that we could begin to experiment and explore with for education? What would facilitate that type of interaction where you feel like you're in Athens and you have a discussion with a Nobel laureate, whether it's um, um, Daniel Kahneman or, or someone else, and you're not only listening, but there's a feedback. There's this type of interaction that as he speaks, he can al also demonstrate some ideas. He can also vividly um, evoke some emotions, convey those to you, and you can interact with him. The fact that you could do this on a sort of virtual stadium or virtual um, Athenian place where everyone in the world sort of that's interested in that discussion can join and, and interact, I believe is tremendously more valuable than, let's say, clicking on a website and then just listening that and, and so forth. And this just begins the conversations. There, there are many directions you can go with this, but finding this simple, first step, I believe, is almost like a breakthrough in itself because you can see the future, that's one thing, but can you see the first step that creates a new type of world immediately today? Trying really hard not to tell everybody what is happening on the 10th of December, but you know, I, I like it. I will throw in one more thing, which is unlike every other project out there, unlike every other collaboration, it's all interconnected. So, you know, the power that you're bringing with X-Worlds connects to our work with other side, connects to other worlds we haven't announced yet. So all of you will be able to explore this whole constellation of opportunity and move value from world to world. And I think this is the first time ever of multiple worlds being connected together in that way. It's completely unique to this project. You know, no, I don't know anything about what's happening in December. So <laughs> he does I can say whatever I want because I don't, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> um, you have so to, you have to buy some. I hope I'm GLD. not channeling the truth here. Um, the idea of a viable public commons oh, would be incredible, where people can come and do what we're doing right here. Meaning that one, say, some people on stage can get up and talk about something to several hundred other people. I can see their faces. I can see if people smile. I can hear if they clap. Um, it works. Somebody can't come in and just destroy the whole experience for everybody else. Those are hard problems, but I think that Second Life and no other world that's yet been built has gotten to that yet. And I think that if we had a public commons, you talk about positive impact. In some sense, I would say, not to, not to dismiss it, but I would say sort of forget about ownership. If you can give us, if you can give the world a place where people can come and have a debate without that debate falling apart into, you know, savagery, uh, you have delivered something to the world that we truly need. 
digital town square right. uh, is what Musk would call <laughs> Twitter, and I, I think extends right. it's this, this idea. Yeah, uh, I if you would have a visual version of this idea, it would definitely open up a completely I new I mean, what gives me chills is we have this now. You know, we, we, we can experiment, and we already sure. are, and we're able to do this. Sure. It's just bringing it all together, and I think that's the magic yes. of the next couple of weeks. Yes. Yeah, the pieces are all close. Yeah. But Twitter's not it. But Twitter's yeah, we, we, we can, we can, 100%, totally agree. Although if, if Twitter wanted to be part of x -Wells, I assume we're all cool with that, right? <laughs> okay. I, I guess so. Them, we're okay with that. All right, all right, all right. I got to talk to you about something afterwards. It's, uh, <laughs> I thought it was interesting how you said that, you know, the connection also between the other side and X World. I think we are also very curious what that looks like. But, you know, it, it's very interesting to see how the space is evolving and how Multiverse X, you know, is also expanding its communities in new areas. So I believe this year in 2022, we've seen a big growth within the community and the ecosystem on the NFT side. I believe if you look at the numbers, you can see how Multiverse X is um, you know, going up the ladder in terms of volume and traction with NFTs. And so I know the audience is full of NFT projects, and I believe they would be very curious to know how are NFTs going to be integrated into the whole value chain of the metaverse. So, I mean, and Benny cut me off if I'm <laughs> going in a different direction here, but I, I, you know, I think we've, has anybody here heard the term dynamic NFT? You guys heard that term, mostly? Um, NFTs are a great level one idea. They help you represent ownership and they usually have a link to something, sometimes an image. I think as we move towards X worlds, we really want to take that idea a lot further. So instead of just a static NFT, imagine a living dynamic object with behavior that can be easily described and then can impact and be used in many different worlds. And for those of you that are familiar what we're doing with M squared, an object can live in any world and can move from world to world and have properties within that space. Now, that's a lot of work, and there's also a lot of effort, and I think things like the portal are going to be very important in this journey as well. But we need to move people away from database entries to, like, living, breathing objects. And it takes a lot of lifting, a lot of energy, and a lot of collaboration. And I think we've put together kind of a dream team here to go and do that as well. You want to expand on this? Because, I mean, you already have dynamic NFTs, right? You guys have had that stuff, ownable objects with, with modifiable properties. That's been Second Life yeah. all the way through. That's true. That's one of the things people don't realize. You know, Second Life today is hundreds of millions of objects in a world the size of Los Angeles. Some of them are, many of them are program, programmable and programmed to have behaviors. And, yeah, it, it is true that uh, one of the core ideas that, drove the success of Second Life, as I mentioned earlier, enabling people to build together, was that these objects were all, all the primitives, the atoms of Second Life were marked with the information that we know today as NFTs. And then on top of that, they were, they were uh, derivable and modifiable in ways that NFTs are not. I would say that some of the, again, fascinating ideas around NFTs that are not necessarily very clear to people is how this idea of 1,000 true fans has turned into this idea of 100 true fans. That sort of as a creative in the world today, um, instead of you having to build a, an empire, a company that um, you, you work for so many years and, and so forth, you can essentially start earning a living start sharing some of the, your ideas, start living your life and, and building your dream today, as long as you can find 100 true fans. Now, if you would have a system that would enable you to share your ideas, whether visually or in some other way, give them a digital expression that incidentally is like an NFT, and then give the possibility for you to exchange these ideas, to, for people to buy these ideas, to be part of your community, and for you to sort of build something like a community around those ideas, then that essentially is a very, very strong 
creative catalyst because it means that creative, brilliant people from all over the world don't have to, let's say, waste energy and time doing something that they don't love at all and that can today start using some of these tools that are built to experiment, explore, and share some of these ideas with people that um, they cannot find in their immediate community, but they can find on the internet. And this idea of the internet making, um, offering the possibility for you to find 1,000 people in this large world is very, very simple. So once you think about it, once you think how many people like almost all types of ideas, and then the fact that you would only have to find 100, for them to believe in what you're building, to experiment with you, is absolutely remarkable. Now, some of the tools, of course, we're building, and uh, we've shared this with Xfabric. Um, you've seen what this has been doing for Unfinished, and I think people will discover how the project looks and, and so forth. But the more gradual, uh, granular the tools, the easier it becomes for people to start creating themselves, start focusing on what they, what they really believe in. And this is just a starting point, because once you can put this in a world to be shared and exchanged and um, explored with much more people, then it just becomes even more valuable, even more fascinating. And um, it's, it's just a starting point of something that I believe will be very, very big. No. Your word, this is great. <laughs> you know, Benjamin, what you said about finding 100 people and having those 100 people kind of create, you know, back you, if you will, you know, sure. create a community. There's another important lesson, and it relates to NFTs from Second Life directly, which is very interesting and really relevant right now with all the blockchain stuff. You have to enable groups of people to collectively own and change the world around them. The simplest example from Second Life that just won't work on the blockchain today is to build something really cool, let's say a motorcycle, that you're going to sell motorcycles in Second mm -hmm. Life. A lot of people do. What do you need? You need, a, you need a person who's a software developer, you need a person who likes Photoshop and does textures, and you need a person that does 3D modeling. It turns out those people are net, th th that those three things are very rarely combined in one person, right? So you need those three people to be able to collectively control the destiny of the things that they're making, right? This applies both to space, working together in a community on a project, and objects that we think of today as NFTs in the virtual world. So one of the critical things we did was enabling groups to come together, easily form, and have control of their own collective property with the same equivalent editing rights. And this is something that, correct me if I'm wrong, we've got more blockchain experts here than, than than me by a long shot, but this is something that still is e ranges somewhere between well, very hard and impossible on the uh, blockchain. It's actually this idea of decentralized autonomous organizations. That's DAOs are, are exactly what you described, giving people common incentives, a shared purpose, and then a way for them to vote or change ideas and make collective decisions in, in a particular direction. So it's, it's quite a huge experiment that's going on that's tried, trying to scale organizing or collective um, efforts in a way that's maybe not doable with previous technologies. But there's also this glue layer, which is embedded in something like Second Life, completely absent in modern, I hesitate to even call them metaverses, but like some of the stuff out there right now. Um, and it's a glue layer that needs to be built very carefully, understanding that ownership is going to be on the blockchain. The content being created needs to be realized inside very sophisticated virtual worlds that potentially have to scale to quite large numbers of people and needs to facilitate concepts of ownership and object property and object modification that may not even fit on a blockchain traditionally. So that glue layer is something that I'm pretty focused on with what we're doing with M squared, but also cannot live alone. It has to connect with all of these other pieces. I think the anatomy of a working metaverse architecture, which spans the real world, uh, cryptocurrency, and virtual experiences, there's just precious few people actually talking about what that practically involves. You know, you hear about all of these like 
Metaverse standard committees and groups of people discussing this stuff, and then none of it practically relates to what needs to happen today. So it's really interesting hearing these perspectives because these are builders. These are people who actually make this stuff. And I think we're going to see a huge gulf between the builders and the people who are just using the word Metaverse as a marketing tool you know, for their existing company. Not to be too harsh. Amazing, I, I think we are um, running out of time soon, but I believe everybody's enjoying this so much, so I, I'm gonna try to grasp a bit more of you, each other. It will be very good. I think Benjamin still didn't answer whether the next X day is gonna happen in the metaverse or not, but let's leave that aside. Um, I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna say, I hope it is, and same. I'm gonna try to convince <laughs> him to make it in the metaverse. That's How about that's that? question. Right? Yeah. 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 Then let me invite Philip as well, and we'll have, again, the setting. Yeah. We'll the continue metaverse. the conversation, definitely. <laughs> As avatars. Okay. Definitely. Fantastic. All right. So um, if you could please, I mean, I mentioned before how many builders and aspiring founders there are in the audience. Um, and this is something we can notice every day, really, how much is going on on the network. Can you please give one last piece of advice uh, to the audience? You know, what are the best tools out there? How can people, you know, try to make something happen? Oh, I'm so biased. What do I do? Um, all right, well, I, I guess I'll say, um, at least from my part, I think you should wait a little bit longer. Uh, you know, I'm of course biased with projects like Other Side and X Worlds, but something is brewing behind the scenes that will create a much better deal for creators. I think if you want to make content and create experiences today, you have a huge problem, which is if you build content for a traditional closed platform, and even things like Sandbox, Decentraland, Roblox, Fortnite, whatever they might be, varying levels of success, you can't really build a business that way. And the reason you can't build a business that way is because the value of what you create will be discounted by investors since it's tied to a single platform. So I, if I were a creator trying to build a business, I would be thinking about platform risk. How can I work in an environment where when I go to an investor, they don't discount my revenue. You know, they actually say, shit, you have a growth story here. And, I'm, and I think if X Worlds and if everything you're hearing about today is successful, and if all of our collective effort is successful, the winners should be the creators. So I think now is the time to be patient. The other thing that I'd say is don't waste your time with anything that isn't, isn't based on real ownership. Because in the end, it's just going to be a house of sand. You're never going to create something lasting, something that people can build on, that people can grow on. Um, and, and those are my, my kind of two pieces of advice. I'll give a, I'll give a uh, well, I don't know what the right word would be for this, so I'll just say it. Just swear, it's fine. <laughs> no, so, no. <laughs> <laughs> no widely used utility that involves social interaction between people has ever taken off that wasn't equally interesting and appealing to all genders. Yeah. Second Life is, is, is balanced uh, in the people who use it. I would, I, would, I would strongly say that we will not see real activity around all of these futuristic ideas until that's true um, for them as well. I mean, that's true for yeah, these experiences as well. What I would um, say is that at the end of the day, you're going to find the tools um, sometimes they'll not work. You're going to try 1,000 things. Sometimes it will work, sometimes it will not. Um, but that's very irrelevant. Like, if you really want to build something, there's absolutely nothing that can stop you. And if you're going to take away just one thing, is that if something stops you, you're letting it stop you. If you don't stop and keep trying, at the end of the day, there's no way you won't find a solution for whatever you're looking for. So I'd only say now more than ever is the time to build. Of course, you'll find challenges. Of course, some things are difficult. This is life. And if, if you've not discovered that yet, then uh, it's, it's a good time to discover that. But other than that, there's absolutely no better time to be alive, 
to have these types of conversations in absolutely any time in history, the level of challenges, whatever, stress, all of that um, is, is hard to make sense of, um, especially with everything we have today. So I'm still overall very, very um, thankful in some sense for, for having these types of interactions, conversations. And I would say as much as you can, seize the opportunity and build and put the effort in something that you really, truly believe in. If you do that, the results in some form or another, I'm sure, will come. Ben, I mean, we're thankful as well. Thank you, for, thank you for bringing these two amazing people here for all of us to get inspired by. Philip, Henran, Benjamin, thank you so much, guys. Thank you.